Continuing production of The Open Mind has been made possible by grants from the Rosalind P. Walter Foundation, the Bluestein Family Foundation, the Thomas and Teresa Malarkey Foundation, the Garfinkel Menard Foundation, the Center for Educational Outreach and Innovation at Teachers College, Columbia University, the Commonwealth Fund, and from the corporate community, Mutual of America. I'm Richard Hefner, your host on The Open Mind, and I'm never prouder than when I can once again welcome to it my dear friend and colleague Elie Wiesel, author, witness, much honored winner of the Nobel Peace Prize, especially today as Random House's Shock and Books publishes our conversations with Elie Wiesel, in which many of our broadcast words from over these many years appear together in print. Now, surely Elie Wiesel is the guest I most closely identify with the open mind's very purpose, to probe as deeply, as honestly, and as freely as concerned men and women can into both the clearly universal and the seemingly more personal issues that in our time must challenge all thoughtful individuals. Of course, the very degree to which Elie Wiesel's beliefs are so deeply rooted in and reflect his Judaic tenets and traditions, while mine are quite so secular, has added an important and provocative dimension to the quality of our exchanges as together we embrace John Milton's singular query, whoever knew truth put to the worse in a free and open encounter. Mr. Wiesel once said here that whatever we do must be measured in personal moral terms. Later, that became the hallmark of the home video dialogue series we produced together, as it is now of our book, Conversations with Elie Wiesel, taking us both back many years through a generation of warm friendship and mutual respect, of affection, indeed of a brotherly love that I know we feel equally. And always, as I think our viewers have long realized, and as I hope our readers will too, civility and a continuing search for the truth and for a sense of personal responsibility in framing our response to challenges have characterized our work together. Now perhaps readers will feel as I do that the most compelling of all our newly published conversations is the last one titled The Mystic Chords of Memory. In it, my guest says, the word memory combines almost all my obsessions, all my priorities. We are committed to memory. I am because of what I remember. If I do what I do, what I'm trying to do, it's again because I remember. And therefore, memory is probably the key word in my vocabulary. Yet Elie Wiesel also feels constrained to one that Memory itself, which should be a sanctuary, has become almost an abomination. And today, I would simply ask my friend to explain that warning, as I did the last time we sat here together, just days before September 11, 2001, a day that everlastingly shall challenge memory. What is it, Ellie, that you think we need to do to understand that abomination comment. Well, September 11th is an explanation. These murderers become murderers because they too remember. But they remember the wrong values, the wrong concepts, the wrong injunctions. They too speak about God. But they turn God into an accomplice, an accomplice to murder. They make God into a murderer. Therefore, I say beware, there are no absolutes. Memory itself cannot be an absolute. We must choose, choose what to do with memory. 
with memory becomes a bridge, a link, a spark that brings people together, then I'm for it. But I have seen on a different level in Bosnia, where they too invoked memory on both sides, just to kill each other. So we must reevaluate, I think, now in the shadow, or in the shadow of the flames and the smoke that hang over our town. Ellie, do you think we're capable of making those distinctions that you would make? We are teachers, you and I. We are trying to teach our students to make those distinctions, which means to look deeper, to think higher. Yet others have not succeeded because we have spoken so many times. And in our book, we uh, speak about our conversations or about those instances when, whether we're talking about the Crusades or in something more recent. That has not been the case. We have not managed to do it. We who? <laughs> well, we who? That's a fair no. question, but what's the answer? Not everyone? Not everyone. Never was a matter for everyone to, become good, to become good or to, to learn lessons. There are good people and people who are not so good. I will tell you what changed me. We speak about the change of, of America, the change of our time, of the era, since uh, September 11. Not only the horror and the absurdity of the crime, but even the way it was done. These men, 19 men, and their accomplices, have decided to kill almost 6,000 people simply because they were there. Just because they were there. Jews and Christians and Muslims, young and old, rich and poor, learned and unlearned, they were there, and therefore they killed them. And they didn't even bother to tell us why. I have studied the, the concept of terror in history for years. I was afraid of nuclear terrorism. I was afraid of terrorism, because terrorism means fear. It means humiliation through fear. Never in the history of terrorism have you encountered such a case when either people commit suicide or kill or together do both without bothering to tell us why. Which means they wanted to offend us even before the, and, and above the offense, that, that we are not worthy of an explanation. Their deed became not only a message, but an offensive, a humiliating message that they are above us. Only they say only death is your explanation. You understand only death. Well, for the first time that that happened, and therefore everything changed. I'll give you a different example, which bothers me terribly. We live in a world now, as you know, which is no more privacy. I came by train today. And people on their cell phones talk about things that I don't want to hear, either business or personal things. No more privacy. But still, there was one area of privacy that remained, and that is the letter. I remember when I was young, I was waiting for a letter from a friend or from a girlfriend or somebody I loved. And they did the trembling, you know, the, the palpitation when they opened the letter, which was destined only to me, meant only for me. And today you can't open the letter anymore because they invaded even that area of our intimate life. So things have changed. Does it mean that they have learned something from terror? Does it? Have they learned? Have they learned before? Oh, they I terrorized us this way. And don't you think we are terrorized? We are. That's why I'm so bothered. And that's why I believe that what I said about memory can be said now about anything, about culture and about, uh, about life, about honor. They thought that they were living a life of honor, that they were dying a death of honor. And indeed, in the eyes of their accomplices, and there may be many, that was the case. But we know that that is not true. But Ellie, I'm puzzled a little at what you say about um, not telling us, not deigning to explain the act. Hadn't Bin Laden, hadn't others for a period of years now warned us that there was here a battle against the great devil? Yes, somebody else spoke for them, but not themselves. Until Those now, 19 men. Exactly. Until now, they 
did it. Those who killed used words as well. And these 19 men decided no words, just death. Death became their word, their language. Isn't that because they themselves were the missiles, they themselves were the bullets, and not those who fired the gun and who loaded right. with money as well as ideas and ideology? And fanaticism and hatred, absolutely. But that means exactly what we are talking about the same thing, that they, as, as missiles, as means, became the language. Their death became the language. But words, after all, I want words. I want to know. They should say, I am going. They didn't, look, they didn't ask for anything. They didn't demand anything. They didn't protest against anything. They didn't claim anything. They didn't even use the, the, the occasion for, for, for ransom, saying, look, unless Israel, for instance, they didn't care about Israel. Bin Laden couldn't care less about Israel. Israel is too small for him. He's a megalomaniac. He wants America, who is big. But if, suppose they would have said, unless Israel evacuates Jerusalem in 40, 40, 24 hours, we do that. Or we are doing it because Israel is not evacuating. Not even that. Again, and that is a precedent. It never happened before. During the French Revolution, when this happened, terror, we knew why. There were words for it. Robespierre used words. And today, what does it mean? There are no more words. What does it mean, what does September 11th, 2001, mean to you in the sense of how does it change you, literally? We spoke here a few days before. You said many things that appear in this book, uh, appear in many, many of your major works. How does Elie Wiesel look differently at the world after that infamous date? I cannot, in truth, I, I, I must make an effort to speak to my students with greater hope. Greater hope? Yes. To tell them, look, nevertheless, and yet there is hope, there must be hope. Because you feel less? No, I feel there was less hope, because if that, if that could happen in our country, I said, maybe something was not wrong with us, but with the whole world. Uh, I, I, look, I, this is still a time, really, I believe, not yet for self-examination, not yet. I don't think America should still, should now at this point say, what did we do wrong? Everything must be concentrated now on the mourning, on the healing, and on the idea of terror, and fight the war. I am, I am for the war that President uh, Bush is waging against terror. I'm for it with a heavy heart. I don't like war. I abhor war, but we must fight it. If not, they will use tomorrow, they may use, and they could use, and probably would use tomorrow, means, weapons, hatred, armed hatred that would cause more, more casualties. So I have to find now a way of saying, look, this is not, I know people say it's because of, we didn't care less, care, care enough about the poverty of people. That, a day after tomorrow. For the moment, the dead haven't been buried yet. True, true. Uh, now, a uh, question. You mentioned Israel. You, you said they didn't say evacuate Jerusalem 24 hours, 48 hours, or this will happen, or something will happen. Uh, Andrew Sullivan in the New York Times, the magazine section, uh, two weeks perhaps after September 11th, wrote an article uh, which he said, it is, yes, it is a religious war. Do you think that it is? It is also a religious war, but not only a religious war. You think bin Laden is simply looking for power? When I say simply, I don't know why I say that. Mm -hmm. Power, control, wealth? I think he wants to broaden the power of Islam, of his concept of Islam. What he really wants is not America even. He knows he cannot get America. He would like to control Saudi Arabia, the Emirates. He would like to become a kind of the caliph for the emperor of, of, of all the Arab nations in the Middle East. And then and Hitler then, told us what he would do once he conquered. Well, he doesn't say more. He simply says that. But you can imagine what he would do with the infidels. But for the moment, that's, I think, what he wants. But it's enough. 
But the, the point of, yes, it is a religious war. It's also, I said, also a religious war. What does that, what light does that throw upon your sense of, of Islam? I don't know enough about Islam. I read the Quran, I read the commentaries, the sutras about, about, uh, about the Quran and Muhammad. There are good things in Islam, as in other religions as well. There are also things in every religion that are not so good, even in ours. You read the Bible, there is a lot of violence in the Bible. Uh, there is, for instance, in our, in our text, in our text in the Bible, speaking, let's say, about the Amalekites. We are supposed to kill all the Amalekites, literally, men, women, and child. However, there was immediately a correction. In the Talmudic commentaries, everything is being done so that we should never know who is an Amalekite. That means we cannot use the excuse to kill somebody because he or she is an Amalekite. But it's in, in the old text. So we know what to choose and what to do with it. And our sages knew what to do with it, to prevent violence, simple, stupid violence. Killing is always stupid. In the Quran there are good things. And there are people, I believe, who believe in those good things. But Bin Laden and his people chose the wrong things. What do you think the, uh, the fate of Jews in America will be in terms of how that fate will be modified because of September 11th? Well, first of all, I really hope that we will not hasten to pass collective judgment on the Muslim citizens in America. We should not do that. We Jews especially have learned what it means to be on the other side, on, on, on the receiving side of collective condemnation. There are good Muslims, as there are others who are not so good. As it, that, that is true of Muslims or Christians or Jews. The terrorists have to be fought, and their accomplices have to be fought and imprisoned and judged. But simply a Muslim, because he or she is a Muslim, we should not. We should treat that person, that child, with honor, with, with, with respect, and with affection. You're not concerned, are you, that uh, the changes that are being made now, even as we speak in our laws, will permit that kind of uh, activity? No, I don't think it will permit. I think on the contrary. I think everybody, really, from the president down, we speak about it. Be careful, don't, 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 do not, do not, because we should not do that. And it's not because I'm afraid of anti-Semitism. It's because it's something we shouldn't do. Israel itself, how unsafe it must be now. I was there since we spoke, actually. I was there for the holidays, for the Sukkot holidays. Israel is like here now, but Israel went through it differently day after day with the suicide bombers. Again, mourning, funerals, fear, parents who are afraid because their children haven't come back in time. They're afraid to send them to the shopping center, to the shopping mall, to the movie house. Because terror is terror. And the only mistake I think that I think that the alliance has made is to choose between good terror and bad terror. That Bin Laden is bad, but Arafat's uh, terrorists are not so bad. They are as bad. How you talk about the way the Israelis live in a reign of terror, feeling the terror imposed upon them. I've wanted very much for people to come here and talk about what the British did during the war, what other peoples have done. How have they survived? Have we the strength to do what the British did in the war, what the Israelis have been doing for years now. Yeah. Do you think we do? I remember Henry Kissinger telling us that he spoke to Assad, the father, the previous president of Syria. He said, we shall always win because America and Israel cannot take suffering. And it's true, in a way, because for us, the moment that a soldier dies, uh, it's a headline, and, and rightly so. When a person dies, we should be sad, we should be outraged if that person died as a victim of injustice. But I think we'll be able to, to take that, because what is at stake is our, not only our future, but our life. I am more and more concerned. We are talking about anthrax. Anthrax is the easiest, the simplest, 
poison that that has been inflicted on us already, but there are worse. Do you think that the concern that has been expressed, certainly in the press lately, about uh, Saddam Hussein and his involvement, possible involvement, this is warranted? It's possible. I don't know. It's not my field. As you know. I'm not a general, nor am I a scientist. But I hear in Israel anybody believe that he was involved. Which makes it all the more dangerous. It's dangerous because if, if Saddam Hussein attacks, if let's say if America attacks Iraq, Iraq attacks Israel. That happened in, in 91 during the Gulf War. I was there. It was, it was incredible. Israel really didn't budge because the president, the father Bush, pre asked Israel not, not to intervene, not to move. And day after day, there was cuts falling on Tel Aviv or other places. I was there. And I used to be able to see the prime minister there and other generals, and they didn't move. For the very first time in Israel's history, Israel did not respond to a direct attack on its people. I don't think that will happen now. You don't think that Israel will be, will, uh, be that self-controlled, no, will time, not choose to be that self-controlled? No, this time, I think, if Israel is attacked, Israel will respond. That means nuclear weapons, don't I it? hope not, really. If, if it begins, then I hope not, really. And the rest of the world and its attitude toward us now? You travel a great deal. In the beginning, we had the sympathy of the world. After all, how can one be civilized and not feel sympathy for America? Do because, you know, we have said it so often. Everybody has said it. We must repeat it, even among ourselves. Among, and because we are two friends, we say everything to each other. The way New York responded, really, was a source of hope and pride to everybody. Really, and therefore, Giuliani is, deserves all the praise, and the policemen, and the firemen. The way New York citizens responded, I went to Ground Zero soon after. It breaks your heart when you think of the victims and the families, but it also it moves you to tears because of the way we responded as human beings, as brothers and sisters of those, of those men and women. So in the world at large, they felt close, as cousins, let's say, but not as brothers. But slowly, I'm afraid, it's moving away. I, I think the only friend now for the moment who's all out is Tony Blair, England. You single out the Prime Minister. You don't say England. I say England, too, apparently. Okay. England is, after all, the English troops are there. The only troops that fight are the English, the British troops. Commandos and the Marines, and they fight. And it's a good fight. It's a just fight. We cannot, we cannot allow terror to, to prevail. One of the few things we did not discuss in our book, we'll have to do something further, we'll do is the book, concept yes. of a just war. Naturally, sure. You've never had trouble with that, that concept? Because it's so rare. Because jo just, just war. war is very rare. There are wars and wars. In our tradition, the Jewish tradition, just wars are so difficult to obtain. The, the, what, what it needs from God and from the high priest and from the Sanhedrin to, to declare a just war. But once the, just, once the war becomes just, there are all kinds of things that are being done. But there are wars, and then there are religious wars, even in our. But just wars is rare. It's a, it's a very rare thing. Uh, Ellie, we should discuss it one day. It's not a fair thing to ask you. We just have a couple of minutes left. When we meet again here, and we will in of course. six months, of course. a year, whatever, what do you think we'll look back on and say, what an incredible change? we couldn't have imagined. I'm asking you to imagine it. <laughs> Richard, my friend, you know that prophecy is a dangerous business in the oh, Jewish religion. <laughs> and you always maintain you are no prophet. I am worried. I am worried that the war will last too long, which means we, we won't get the terrorist. If it lasts too long, the danger is that winter is setting in going to be difficult to fight that war in, in Afghanistan. Bin Laden may emerge as a kind of Salah al-Din, as a hero, 
he will say, look, I stood up not only to America, but to the whole world. That will give him more prestige, more power, more money, more influence. I'm afraid of that. My hope is that he will be caught soon. Is there any indication in your mind that we're capable of catching him? Well, I think what we should take is take really uh, say, send uh, James Bond <laughs> and Rambo, whoever they are, and um, commandos. I think it's not the bombing. The bombing is probably is important. I hope that we'll, again, I am convinced really with all my heart that no American pilot would ever bomb civilian targets intentionally. Or what. I, I'm convinced of that, but people die. But I, I, I think it will be a matter of commandos. They will, they will get him. And our faith, our feelings, our attitudes in this country, the ones that are good, the ones that historically have made you proud to be an American as you are, uh, you think they'll yes, sustain I think, themselves too? I think so. I think people will become closer to one another well, as a result have. of that. That we have. And it will continue. Uh, Ellie, I, I hope that you're right. So do I. Uh, <laughs> Pessimist, optimist, I pessimist, both, both pessimist. Pessimist, pessimist. That's the but, trouble. But, but the two pessimisms together can create an optimism. Two negatives may make a positive. You know, I, I, I may, for once, let me, let me quote, which I've never, I, I don't quote myself. At one point when I needed optimism, I wrote in one of my novels, we all are question marks, but when two question marks meet, something beautiful can emerge. That's a nice point at which I have to say to you, that's all the time we have. Two question marks. Ellie Wiesel, thank you so much for joining me again today. And thank you for the privilege of working on Conversations well, with Ellie Wiesel. It's mine too. And thanks too to you in the audience. I hope you join us again next time. And if you would like a transcript of today's program, please send $4 in check or money order to The Open Mind, P.O. Box 7977, FDR Station, New York, New York, 10150. Meanwhile, as another old friend used to say, good night and good luck. Continuing production of The Open Mind has been made possible by grants from the Rosalind P. Walter Foundation, the Blue Stein Family Foundation, the Thomas and Teresa Malarkey Foundation, the Garfinkel Menard Foundation, the Center for Educational Outreach and Innovation at Teachers College, Columbia University, the Commonwealth Fund, and from the corporate community, Mutual of America.